Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all. Thanks very much for joining us here. Uh, on behalf of the Poverty Alliance, sponsored by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this seminar, which has been given the title The Generation Game, Family, Poverty and Unemployment. This is an event that kind of flies under two different banners at once. Uh, it's part of the Poverty Alliance's Understanding Poverty seminar series, but it's also part of Challenge Poverty Week, which as many of you uh, will know has been going on, is going on this week at uh, all sorts of venues. Let me say just a little bit about both of those banners. First of all, Understanding Poverty seminars are designed really to, to help activists explore some of the issues and the concepts and the truths behind the myths, if you like, of the poverty debate. The word poverty, it always seems to me, it has something of a, the biblical abstraction about it. It's a little bit like pestilence and plague. It's one of those words we kind of toss about, not always thinking terribly deeply about what it means. And one of the aims of the series is to get behind that to look at the realities of what poverty means, what it looks like in the 21st century in a post-industrial market economy, uh, to focus discussion on aspects of the phenomenon that might not always command the attention that they deserve. That's really sort of a space um, where there's time to reflect on what's meant by some of the more glib terminologies and assumptions, and thereby the hope is to inform and refresh the policy process. The series also works to build up an evidence base so that we can start trying to meet the myths with truths. Challenge Poverty Week is a program of events involving many different campaign groups and charities. And the aim of that is to build awareness of the real issues and again challenge some of the myths, thereby helping to build momentum for change and showing that the conventional orthodoxies about poverty are at the, best, at the very least open to question and challenge. Now, that's unashamedly a political agenda, but it's not a party political agenda. And I think it would be a shame today, it would be easy, but it would be a shame if our discussions kind of degenerated into a, a, a partisan rant of one sort or the other. What we're trying to do is expose the fallacies that underlie a set of beliefs that seem increasingly to underpin policy right across much of the party spectrum. The belief that poverty is somehow the fault of the poor uh, that the benefit system feather beds the feckless and the work shy, and that unemployment is largely down to insufficient coercion. Um, now, that might sound like the sort of agenda one would want to throw in the face of the right wing, and yet, I don't know if you can see this, this is from Sunday's Observer. Headline says, Labour will be tougher than the Tories on benefits, pledges party's new welfare chief. And it's an interview with Rachel Reeves, who's the new shadow Work and Pension Secretary, in which she says, we would be tougher than the Conservatives if they, which is the unemployed, don't take the offer of a job, they will forfeit their benefits. There will also be opportunities under a Labour government. So it is an agenda that increasingly seems to run across the political spectrum, and I think it would be helpful if we can try and keep that in mind today. It's the agenda we're here to discuss rather than the, the partisan politics of it. One element in the myth seems to, that, that, that uh, we hope to bring under the spotlight today is the idea of intergenerational poverty, the idea that cultures of worklessness develop, which somehow transmit poverty from generation to generation of the same social groups. That This uh, purportedly culpable phenomenon of dependency is held to become a sort of an inherited way of life, almost a genetic trait. We're going to look at how much, if any, evidence exists to support that belief, how it's being reflected in public policy, why the narratives surrounding it seem to be so powerful and enduring, what it's meant in terms of stigmatizing poverty, how anti-poverty campaigners can address it, and how policy can be made to reflect the realities rather than the mythologies of poverty. The format for the day is going to be like this. It's going to be, we're going to start with a series of presentations this morning from leading authorities in the field of poverty studies. Each of them is going to speak for 15 or 20 minutes, and then there'll be a space for questions, comments, and discussion involving yourselves. After lunch, we're going to break up into themed discussion groups at your tables, um, and you're going to have a facilitator at each table to try and focus that discussion and look at a number of particular themes that we hope to try and bring out of that. We'll end the day with an open panel discussion 
uh, a panel of the reliably opinionated who will be here to sort of field your thoughts and reactions to what you've heard across the day, what's come out in your own discussions. And we hope, perhaps try to find out if there's some common ground, some common themes that we all want to take forward in our work ahead. Um, let me just stress the interchange that's involved in all of that. This is explicitly not a lecture cycle. Uh, it's a seminar. We want everybody to speak as well as to listen across the day. We want everybody to contribute something to the discussion. The day is going to be filmed, just to, to add to the torment, um, not, not just so that vindictive action can be taken against anybody who doesn't contribute to the discussion, but also with a view to sharing the day uh, more widely on the Poverty Alliance's YouTube channel. Uh, for the same reasons, the itchy thumbed among you are being urged to tweet uh, what you're making of the day, and a hashtag has been set up, I think it's up on screen somewhere, there it is, hash CPW13. So if you would like to tweet, please include that, please use that hashtag. Now we're going to begin the day with something of a historical perspective, courtesy of a public policy historian who's specialized in the linkages between poverty and other forms of social deprivation and written widely around the topic of exclusion in the underclass from Lancaster University. Would you please welcome Dr. John Welshman. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, Keith. It's, it's, very, um, it's very nice to be here. Can you hear me okay at the back? Yeah. Um, I've called my um, presentation um, Troubled Families, Policy, Discourse Policy and Intervention Since um, 1880. Um, but one point I wanted to make perhaps at the start is that um, while there are links with policy initiatives um, in Scotland, such as, for example, the Dundee uh, Families Project, um, I'm aware that the Troubled Families um, agenda isn't as um, big here as in other parts of the UK. And, I mean, perhaps that's one issue that we might usefully um, explore in discussion. Certainly very little of the evidence that I will um, cite is Scottish in terms of its authors or its uh, location. Um, however, I hope what I have to say will be um, useful in understanding current policy and its possible um, direction in Scotland. Um, I'm speaking to you as a historian and um, what I want to do really is to explore how prevalent um, intergenerational ideas have been in terms of the history of the underclass um, concept. Um, and my argument really is that the um, same um, basic idea has been invented and reinvented in both the United Kingdom and the United States over the past um, 133 years. Um, in the 1880s, commentators such as Charles Booth began to talk about uh, what they called a social residuum, a residue, what's basically left behind. Then, in the interwar period, and uh, partly under the influence of eugenics, um, attention switched to what was seen as a social, a so-called social problem group. The successor to this was the problem family notion of the 1940s and 1950s. In order to trace the next um, step in the chain, we have to cross the Atlantic to the culture of poverty debates um, of the 1960s uh, in the United States. Back in Britain, the conservative politician Sir Keith Joseph popularized his theory of a cycle of deprivation in the early 1970s. The 1980s, of course, saw a lengthy debate about an underclass on both sides of the uh, Atlantic. From the mid-1990s, this attention switched um, to the socially excluded, particularly under the, uh, the Labour governments. And finally, from 2010 onwards, at least in uh, England, uh, the coalition government has focused attention on 120,000 troubled families. Um, as other um, people have um, noted, I think the underclass concept has several key strands. 
Um, first, perhaps, is the way that the concept has been used, um, notably by those on the right, to um, signify and uh, denote the uh, alleged behavioral uh, inadequacies of the poor. Second, there's its use, including sometimes by those on the left, to describe the ways in which um, wider structural processes have contributed to a situation in which groups with poor access to education and skills risk being left behind. Third, there's the belief that the, work, the underclass exists separately from the working class. Fourth, what I um, sometimes call a combination of um, rhetorical symbolism and empirical complexity, by, what, by which I mean really this is partly about real issues, things like income, housing, uh, family formation, uh, employment, but that the concept also operates at a kind of um, metaphorical or um, symbolical level um, for anxieties whose empirical proof remains uncertain. And fifth, I guess, what really concerns us today, the recurring belief in intergenerational continuities. Um, in the time available, um, I want to document, really, um, how a belief in intergenerational continuities can be found in every reincarnation of the underclass concept since the 1880s. Um, to try to explain why cycle ideas enter the policy process, and to see what consequences this has for policy development. And my argument, um, in a nutshell, is that first, um, the underclass is a social construction, and um, second, that policymakers support the theme of intergenerational continuities, um, not because of any evidence, um, but for um, ideological and political um, reasons. Um, the concept of an underclass certainly goes back earlier than the 1880s to um, ideas of the deserving and the undeserving poor um, in the early um, modern period. But in the 1880s, a range of commentators that included Charles Booth began to talk in a more concerted way about a social residuum in London. They were influenced in part by Charles Darwin and what came to be called social Darwinism. And ideas about degeneration and heredity uh, were... Were, were certainly prominent. Um, in his article, The Nomad Poor of London, for example, published in 1885, the journalist Arnold White wrote that, quote, physically, mentally, and morally unfit, there is nothing that the nation can do for these men except to let them die out by leaving them alone. To enable them by unwise compassion to propagate their kind is to hand on to posterity a legacy of pure and unmixed evil. The belief in unemployables died out during the First World War. As the historian Gareth Stedman Jones has written, quote, once employment opportunities became widely available, they could not be found. In fact, he concluded, quote, they had never existed except as a phantom army called up by late Victorian and Edwardian social science to legitimize its practice. Nevertheless, in the 1920s, the search began again for an underclass, not this time called a social residuum, but a social problem group. The eugenics society played a central role, and it funded the work of E.J. Lidbetter, a poor law relieving officer in the East End of London, who was trying to prove that pauperism was inherited. By 1920, for example, <clears throat> Lidbetter had traced between 400 and 500 pauper pedigrees, and he classified them into three groups. First, those characterized by the inheritance of mental defect. Second, a low-grade type of uh, mildly incompetent persons. And third, a group that was distinctly non-moral. Lidbetter claimed that he had found, quote, a definite race of chronic pauper stocks intermingled with the general community not recruited to a large extent from the normal population, and not sensibly decreased by the agencies for the promotion of human efficiency, 
Lidbetter made very little reference to wider social conditions, and his admission that military conscription and improved employment during the First World War reduced the pauper population um, showed that it was essentially a statistical artifact. By the late 1930s, the eugenic society was forced to admit that the existence of a, the social problem group had not been proven. As so often in the history of the underclass, its members conceded that more research was necessary. The Second World War witnessed yet another conceptual stepping stone with the invention of the problem family. The term appeared first in a social survey about the evacuation of children from the cities to the countryside. The authors of the Our Towns Report, published in 1943, drew on the Victorian idea of the submerged 10th claiming that within it were the problem families who were on the edge of pauperism and crime, riddled with mental and physical defects, in and out of the courts for child neglect, a menace to the community of, out of all proportion to their numbers. The idea was taken up by members of the eugenics society, public health doctors, and family service units, and it exercised an important grip over social policy in the 1940s and 1950s with local authorities using health visitors and home helps to rehabilitate these families. As in the 1930s, the fear of intergenerational continuities was very much present. Tom Stevens, for example, wrote in 1944 of the work of family service units that, quote, the problem family are left untouched by much of the help they need. They stay behind when their neighbors are rehoused their children are not taken to the clinics, and the most undernourished child never gets his free milk and vitamins. Somehow the answer to their need must be found if we are to avoid another generation of problem families. In order to trace the next link in the chain, we have to cross the Atlantic to the United States. The culture of poverty was the brainchild of Oscar Lewis, professor of anthropology at the University of Illinois. Following fieldwork with families in Puerto Rico and New York, Lewis wrote that as an anthropologist, he had tried to understand poverty as, quote, a culture, um, or more accurately, as, as a subculture with its own structure and rationale as a way of life which is passed down from generation to generation along family lines. People in the culture of poverty, he argued, did not belong to trade unions, were not members of political parties, were not participants in the welfare system, and did not make use of banks. Characteristics at the family and individual level included alleged marginality, dependence, inferiority, a strong focus on the present, and an inability to defer gratification or to plan for the future. Moreover, Lewis claimed that the culture of poverty was not just an adaptation. Once established, it tended to perpetuate itself through the generations because of its effects on the children. Um, by the age of six or seven, argued Lewis, slum children, quote, have usually absorbed the basic values and attitudes of their subculture and are not psychologically geared to take full advantage of changing conditions or increased opportunities which may occur in their lifetime. Back in Britain, the 1970s were marked by debates over the cycle of deprivation. Here the key figure was the conservative politician Sir Keith Joseph. In a speech given in June 1972, he posed what seemed to him the paradox of why, despite long periods of full employment, relative prosperity, and an improvement in community services since the Second World War, deprivation persisted so conspicuously. He argued that perhaps there was at work here a process by which problems reproduced themselves from generation to generation. As you can see here, Joseph's speech led to a large-scale research program into what was called transmitted deprivation. Moreover, an interview that he gave in June 1973 again demonstrated how central intergenerational continuities were to the cycle. Joseph said that a director of social services had told him, quote, we have 20,000 households in this city. Nearly, nearly all our problems, delinquency, truancy, deprivation, 
poverty and the rest come from about 800 of them. And I think that most of the families have been known to us for five generations. Although the research went ahead, it was revealing that the authors of the literature review, given the task of researching the cycle of transmitted deprivation, chose instead to call their book Cycles of Disadvantage. Moreover, speaking in 1974, Peter Townsend condemned the cycle. He said it was, quote, a mixture of popular stereotypes and ill-developed, mostly contentious scientific notions. It is a conceptual bed into which diverse travelers have, traveled, have scrambled for security and comfort. The 1980s were marked by, by the search for an underclass, initially in the United States, then subsequently in Britain. Perhaps the biggest difference between the two was the much greater focus on race in the former. But in both countries, commentators occupied one of four positions. And this is really Rob's framework. First, for many on the right, the underclass represented a group whose problems were essentially those of behavior, illegitimacy, family breakdown, and violent crime. This interpretation included the argument of Charles Murray that it was also the social policies of the 1960s rather than the people themselves which were to blame. Welfare was the problem, not the solution. Second, there were those who tended to locate the underclass in terms of structural factors such as shifts in employment trends and changes in the spatial concentrations of poverty in the inner cities. Third, the largest group, certainly in Britain, were agnostics who were attracted to the idea of an underclass um, but found no evidence. And fourth, there were those who were more hostile to the notion but nevertheless were interested in the functions of the term. Again, with the first especially, there was a clear belief in intergenerational continuities. In 1990, for instance, the sociologist Alan Buckingham drew on data from the National Child Development Study to argue that, quote, the distinct attitudes of the underclass, when coupled with evidence of inter- and intragenerational stability of membership, provide early evidence that a new social class, the underclass, may now exist in Britain. The Labour government elected in May 1997 was attracted to the concept of social exclusion. However, whereas Labour in the years immediately after 19, 1997 established Sure Start and committed itself to abolish child poverty, particularly towards the end of Tony Blair's period in office, it moved to a much more authoritarian and punitive stance on antisocial behaviour and problem families. Part of the work of the Respect Unit set up in 2006 under Louise Casey was to help, quote, prevent the problem families of tomorrow. Moreover, in a BBC interview, for example, given in August 2006, um, Blair said, quote, if we are not prepared to predict and intervene far more early, then there are children that are going to grow up in families that we know perfectly well are completely dysfunctional, and the kids a few years down the line are going to be a menace to society and actually a threat to themselves. There was now a belief that a minority of families, around 2%, faced multiple and entrenched problems and cost the state around £100,000 a year. The new belief that it was possible to predict those families that were likely to cause trouble in the future and that such families could be rehabilitated Lay behind, lay behind the establishment of the Family Nurse Partnership and Family Intervention Projects. Finally, we come to the present day with the attempts by the coalition government to tackle troubled families. The emphasis on intergenerational continuities was clear from the start. In a speech in December 2011, David Cameron had talked about, quote, a culture of disruption and irresponsibility that cascades through generations. It was estimated that the state had spent nine billion pounds the previous year on just 120,000 families, 75,000 pounds per family. Louise Casey was appointed head of a troubled families unit in the Department for Communities and Local Government. The government committed 448 million pounds to turning around, in their words, the lives of these families. Moreover, it is Louise Casey who, who has perhaps been most explicit on the intergenerational theme. 
In a report published in June of last year, based on interviews with 16 troubled families, she wrote that the themes that had emerged were the complexity of these, were quote, the complexity of these families' lives and the length of time the problems had gone on for, in many cases from, from generation to generation. We did not meet many families whose problems did not start in their own childhood or whose children or some of their children were not now repeating the same patterns as their parents. What could be established was the extent to which the problems of these families are linked and reinforcing. They accumulated across the life course, passed on from parents to their children across generations of the same family. The statements by Casey in particular have been very selective, often anecdotal, and highly speculative. <coughs> Research has demonstrated that the alleged figure of 120,000 troubled families is totally spurious, and the methods used to identify and rehabilitate them show striking continuities with the approach of the family service units in the 1940s. Whether a family intervention project actually work is currently still open to question, even using the government's own criteria. By September of this year, only 14,000 families had been, uh, in their words, turned around. Thus, it should now be clear uh, it, should, it should be clear by now that alleged intergenerational continuities have been perhaps the most central strand in the invention and reinvention of underclass concepts over the past 130 years in both Britain and the United States. How and why do cycle ideas enter the policy debate? First, it is clear that this is very little to do with evidence and more to do with the ideological or political usefulness of these ideas. While there are claims that statements are based on evidence, sometimes data sets, interviews, or observation, usually the evidence is flawed, or more often is simply a claim or assertion, notably by practitioners on the ground. Second, the belief that a defiant number of families cause the bulk of social problems can be reassuring. While this is sometimes the product of anxiety or alarm, it can also be a comforting discovery that major economic or social change is unnecessary. Third, there is the belief in stability of membership, the re repetition of patterns, that this is somehow more than poverty, that poverty per se is not the issue. Fourth, it's striking how often the appeal is on the basis of innocent or blameless children. It's the parents who are stigmatized. Last, there is the repeated insistence on the alleged cost to the taxpayer and the state and linked to that the promise of prediction, prevention, intervention, solution. It is clear that these ideas have important functions and benefits for those who use them. What then are the consequences of Cycle's rhetoric for policy development? First, that as well as the alleged costs, the political rhetoric focuses on the size of the problem group. From the submerged 10th of late Victorian Britain, to the 120,000 troubled families of the present day. Second, that this leads to a, a focus on identifying the problem group at the local level. It is very striking how this is exactly the same as in the 1940s. Work out how many problem families there are at the national level, identify them at the local authority level, then try to rehabilitate them. Third, that this narrows the policy front Sterilization and segregation of mental defectives in the 1930s in order to eliminate reproduction and the intensive interventions with very small numbers of families that we get with the family nurse partnership and family intervention projects. The focus moves to parenting and children from the wider society to inside the home and to the alleged value of practical help. Finally, the, the cycle's rhetoric is used both to justify the introduction of particular policies, but also their implementation, especially claims of effectiveness, success, numbers of families rehabilitated, and an alleged reduction in costs. Over 130 years of sustained research has failed to kill off myths of cultures of poverty and cycles of deprivation. That is, that is because this is a debate that continues for ideological and political reasons rather than because of evidence. Thank you.
very much indeed, John. We've got five or ten minutes for you to raise points and questions and issues of clarification with John. What we'd like you to do, please, is we have, we're going to try and do this with floor mics. So if you can raise a hand, we'll get a floor mic to you. And if you can tell us who you are, that would also be helpful just for purposes of the recording uh, of the day. So can I see somebody who'd like to kick us off, please, with any points or questions to John? In the front here, yeah. Can we get a, a floor mic up to this table here? Um, good morning. Uh, Edward Harkins uh, here as an individual uh, worker in my own right. Uh, I, I think my question really is probably directly for John. Uh, uh, last year I read a really interesting book, uh, Danny Dorling. Uh, mm. If I've got it the right way around, I think it was Social Injustice, Why Inequality Persists, or else the other way around. Um, his, one of his core points was that um, the, it, the, the perpetuation of the, the myths of elitism and um, efficiency and effectiveness um, it is promoted by many of the folks, um, I suspect some of your own colleagues, um, who are actually engaged in what you think are socially progressive occupations, civil service, welfare departments, academics, etc. Uh, and in fact, those people are, are, are quite often quite aggressive uh, torch holders for some of these theories of deprivation, um, the underclass, etc. I wonder if you could say a bit more about what your views are on that, the roles of individuals in some of these institutions. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. You mentioned Danny Dorlin. Of course, he's a, a geographer and very interested in um, inequalities of place, location. Uh, it's quite striking how uh, there are these historical continuities in places that have remained poor, not just cities, but particular parts of, uh, of cities. But um, in terms of the role of individuals, I mean, I, I was saying beforehand, I, one of the things I did in the last week was to, um, uh, I discovered there are some uh, videos by Louise Casey on YouTube, and I, I, spent, I spent a couple of time looking, a bit, some time looking at a couple of these. One was to the Royal College of General Practitioners, um, and there were a couple of other ones. And they're, they're, they're well worth watching, I think, uh, about 20 minutes long, not because of the content, but uh, because of what she's saying and the way in which she says it. And it's quite, well, very worrying for me, I think, that a person like that has got so much power within uh, the coalition government and making these statements which are entirely speculative, not based on evidence at all. Um, I suppose that the reason that she's occupied, I mean, I think she's a good example of the kind of thing you're talking about. I guess the reason that she's held these very senior positions under both the Labour governments and the coalition governments is that she appears to kind of offer a common sense solution to what is a very complex problem. I mean, I guess that would be my answer is to, apart from her personal qualities, she's a pretty forceful person, but that she you know, appears to hold out this sort of a solution. I mean, this is the way that civil servants look at the, and policy makers look at these problem, uh, these issues, what's the problem, how much does it cost us, uh, what's the intervention, what's the solution? What's your suspicion as to why this agenda has run less in Scotland, or appears to have run less in Scotland than the rest of the UK? Is it simply that we don't have the, the writing, we don't have the data, or, I mean, I'm sure many of us would love to think it's because we've got this fine, noble, communitarian tradition that makes us understand these things a whole lot better than the English do, but I'm sure mm. that's not the case. What's your, your suspicion for why it's been less of an agenda in Scotland? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I guess I hesitate to offer some arguments about that because I'm, I suppose, less familiar with the specific policy context in Scotland. One thing that I have done, though, uh, in terms of historical research was that um, at one time I became very interested in the evacuation of children during the Second World War. Um, and I've written various articles about that in a book. And uh, we decided that one of the things that people hadn't done in terms of the evacuation of children was to take a kind of local or regional perspective. And so we decided mm -hmm. to write an article on evacuation in Scotland, uh, which was pretty um, extensive. And we were very struck when we did that research that the problem family discourse, which is, comes to dominate the debate, I think, in the rest of Britain from sort of 1943 onwards, following something called the R. Towns Report, um, is, uh, seem, seem to us to be entirely absent from the debate in Scotland. There are parallel documents. In fact, there is a report called R. Scottish Towns. Yeah. But there's very little mention of problem families. And I guess um, we tried to explain that, that 
the, the, in Scotland, in the Scottish context, there seemed to be much more emphasis on overcrowding from the 1930s onwards, uh, much more discussion about poverty, a greater focus on kind of structural uh, as opposed to behavioural factors. Mm. A lot of it tied to migration internally too within the country. Anybody else want to come in on this? Yeah, one there and then down the front here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Michael Smith. Can you hear me? I work for the NHS. And I, um, I sort of sense quite a, there's a negative tone to what you're saying about some of the interventions in some of the previous slides, which um, I'm interested in because in the NHS, in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, we are investing quite significantly in several of the things that are above your head there on the slide. And to my knowledge, that's not because we believe in an underclass. It's not because we believe in intergenerational transmission. And it's not because we buy into a troubled families agenda. Mm. But we do perceive that there is a need to support people with some of these things. Now, for example, the Family Nurse Partnership isn't aimed at an underclass. It's aimed at all mothers under 20. And I just wonder, is it that you, you, you're not keen on the interventions or is it the kind of the... The, struck, the, the kind of conceptual thinking behind it that, you, that troubles you. Yeah, thanks. That, 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 that's a very good point, I think. Um, I mean, I suppose we could try and... Is it possible to separate out the rhetoric around the interventions from the interventions themselves? And clearly, I, what I've been talking about is, is kind of partly the discourse, which, where I think this focus on intergenerational um, continuities is very striking. But I... I I tried to be quite cautious at the end by making the point, particularly about the family intervention projects, that we simply don't know at the moment whether they've succeeded or not. Um, I've read a lot. I've read, um, I think, all the uh, evaluations that have um, been produced on those. Um, there, there is a greater acceptance, I think, within government that um, studies have to be longitudinal. They have to include a control group. Um, but I think at the moment. Um, uh, uh, we have to, um, well, we simply don't know. The, the government has commissioned a large-scale evaluation of the whole Troubled Families Programme, which I think is going to report in 2016. Um, I mean, there was quite a good programme on this. I think it was called Britain's Broken Families, which was shown on BBC a couple of weeks ago. It was a case study of two family intervention projects in Newcastle. And I sort of find it quite interesting to reflect on it myself, because the two case studies, I mean, there were only two studies, but they did appear to be doing some good. And I sort of found myself reflecting on my own perspective, and I sort of thought, well, yeah, it's okay for me to sit in my university office having uh, you know, time to read about these things, and perhaps, as you say, being rather negative about them or critical about them, whereas these projects on the ground you know, may be doing some good. Um, but I think the evidence is, is unclear at the moment. The Family Nurse Partnership, I guess, is slightly different, but um, there, there has been some... I mean, it's very small scale, of course, for one thing, um, but there um, has been some interesting academic work on that, suggesting that the sort of perspective around the family nurse partnership is very much on sort of at risk, that the, the kind of discourse is one of people at risk, and it, it, it sort of moves folks very much to these uh, vulnerable mothers and, and households. So, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I take your, your point. Um, I think. I suppose speaking as a historian, um, we are thinking of intervention, the history of interventions. There hasn't always been interventions. I mean, quite at some points there is the discourse, but actually nothing has really been done at either the local government or the national government. But even where there are interventions, that there's no real evidence that, that they worked. It's not, a, it's not a question you can answer with the historical evidence. Time, time for one more. I have, I have two rows back there. Yeah. Oh, uh, could you hear? Yeah. I'm Angus Wood. I work for Bernardo's in North Glasgow. Um, it's a comment and a question to, to everybody, really. I'm not entirely comfortable with the thought that Scotland's so different and everything's kind of sorted. I, I, I just believe that in this city and, and, and in Scotland we do have issues, and not just issues of poverty, but I think there are some certain kind of policy um, interventions that have got something of the flavour of what's up on the screen there. Um, as a, I'd, I'd like to open that question up to everybody, really. Thanks. Okay, I, I'd hoped I'd larded my question about that with the usual journalistic cynicism, but maybe not quite enough of it. Can you respond to that? 
I mean, are you, how do you, should, should we be comfortable about this in Scotland or should we treat it with, with, with scepticism? I took that as a question to the audience. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps it was. Anybody want to, to respond? Sorry, I don't want to hog the mic. I suppose the, the question for me is, I think we should be scepticism. We should be sceptical. I don't think Scotland is inherently that different from the rest of the UK. But the question really is, do we just walk away then? If nothing's working and it's all formed of false mm -hmm. ideas, do we just leave it? And I find, that hard to, I find that hard to accept. It feels we should be engaged in trying to do what we can and evidence-based. And so I'm, I'm troubled by this because I'm not sure where that leaves us if we want to do something positive. I think where it leaves us is it frames us with the discussion for much of the rest of the day, to be perfectly honest. I think that, that's exactly the agenda that we're going to need to address across the day. For now, would you please join me in thanking John Welshman.